Sorry. You got this on tape? <laughs> <laughs> I wish it did. <laughs> it does. Yeah, that's 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 ready. That's ready. Yeah. You ready? Yep. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> you have comedy routine already. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> it's good to have everybody with us this morning at My Dog Fellowship Church. Had a few technical disabilities. Uh, dis disabilities. So a few technical problems. My mouth is one of them. I can't talk plain, I guess. But uh, <clears throat> we are here, and we're glad you're joining us today. And we just want to uh, let you know that uh, the memorial service for Jess King went real well, we thought. And plenty of food. A lot of people stayed for the food, and we had a really good service, and I thought, and uh, special singings, Jess's songs, and uh, many others that, uh, well, uh, Elvis Jr. Uh, shared uh, about three songs with us. So we had a great time, and now we're going to continue to pray for the family, the King family, uh, Jess King's family, and uh, there's quite a bit of his family. So if you will, keep him in, uh, keep the family in prayer as they grieve over Jess. We're going to miss him dearly, and we uh, know that he was quite a large part of our church. His guitar is there, his amp, but uh, he's not. And so, But you know what? He's in a better place, and he wouldn't want to come back for any reason at all. So we just want to uh, just ask you to continue to pray for the family. And now... <clears throat> Um, Terry, since I'm playing Terry right now, where are you at? Okay. Oh, okay, Terry. Uh, what were the announcements? I can make those while I'm up here if you want. We have, uh, Come on up here, Terry. Just come on up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take your job away. There we go. Tell us what we got coming up, would you? Well, it was nice to see the Southerners were here last night, but they were just here to visit, and then they left before the service was over on that. They probably had many other things to do, but we will be having the Southerners here in a couple weeks for that, so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, there will be also a dinner that will follow, so that will be another great time. It was a wonderful meal last night. Oh, yes, so, it was. Uh, can't wait to find out how round two will be when we have another wonderful <laughs> meal. So this will be good. Leftovers many times better than the first. You know? <laughs> so we're having yeah, a big meal because we had quite a bit of food we're eating again today. So. so in two weeks we'll have kind of what we had last night and that's what you're saying, leftovers? So, okay. <laughs> I think we're kidding on that. But that's all right. So let's see. And then also uh, next year there will be another group, and I forget the, I'm sorry, I forget the other. Uh, Calvary's Love. Calvary's Love will be here 3rd. in 2022. Well, it sounds like a long way off, doesn't it? 2022. But then when uh, it was the year 2000, you probably never even thought about the year 2021. So, and here, here we are. Uh, let's see. Other announcements? I think that might oh, Wednesday night. Oh, yes. Wednesday night Bible study. We are still on chapter 12, but that's a good thing because we're going through that book and chapter verse by verse, and that's the best way to learn the fact. Just getting into the details, you know, it's called getting into the meat of the information here. So it's been really good. So we're being fed uh, through the, the wonderful meals that we have there, and then we also have the spiritual food, so that's a double blessing. On that. It's just been a great time. So do be here around 6.15 over at the Fellowship Hall uh, for for the, the meal that we can get into, and then also after that, at 6.30, starts the Bible study. Pastor Tony will be running that. It'll be a great time. And you'll be with me running that. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I'll be on the side. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. God bless you. And so we're, we're happy that uh, you're joining us today. And now, Richard Robbins, if you'll come on up. What? Special music? Yes. All right. Yes. Special music yes. by Ernestine Robbins. Or Ernie Robbins. Either way. Right? right? Either way.
there is something um, something that the Lord wanted me to share with you all. Uh, Richard knows about it. But I was awoken in the middle of the night a few weeks ago. I didn't share it because I didn't I wanted to make sure it was from God. I wanted to make sure that he wanted me to share it and when. Because sometimes I get impulsive and do things before I think. Don't want to overthink it, but I ask God if this is just a dream or a vision, then I need something. I don't like to ask for a sign, but I wanted to make sure it was from him. I was woken up about 2 o'clock in the morning. I had been waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning almost every single night. And I asked, usually it's for me to pray for somebody. Somebody will come into my thoughts or I'll feel like he wants me to pray for someone. Well, this time it wasn't that I saw what I thought was my husband. He pulled up a chair, which I had in our room, and I put it, or he put it right beside the bed, and he took my hand in his and cupped it, and he leaned over, and he said that there, he said it was time to get up, and he said that, uh, are you ready for some coffee, which he does every morning? But instead of going and leaving, he just sat there for a while and kept holding my hand. And all of a sudden, it was just a baby. Even now, I get chills thinking about it. There was a baby all over me. And the next morning, I said, I've got to go get coffee. Are you ready for some coffee? It's time to get up. I said, you already made the coffee. He goes, no, I didn't. I didn't make the coffee. I said, didn't you get up earlier and already make it? He said, no, I, I, I didn't get up. Then I started thinking about this man who looked like my husband, that his hair was all curly in every hair in place. If you know my husband, a lot of times his hair is anything but in place. It really isn't. It just a skew all over the place. And he was wearing something that was more like a robe. As he was walking away, I saw it went almost to the floor. And I thought, he doesn't wear clothes like that. Was this a visit from you, Lord? Well, I started thinking, I think that's the reason I needed something to confirm if that was really from him, from the Lord. And as I went about my daily routine of brushing my hair and things, I had a heart-shaped bruise on my leg. And there was a, a line going from north to south. It was like he came down because I was asking for more from him. And he gave it to me. And I thought, do you want me to tell my husband? He knows about things like this that's happened to me before. I could share story after story. And he gave me another sign of whether to tell the church. And I had a heart-shaped bruise on my forearm. He took pictures of both. And, okay, when do you want me to tell him? I 
could have shared this yesterday, but I did not want to take away from what was going on. I didn't, I didn't feel I should do that. I felt led to wait until today to share with you the amazing love that he has for all of us. When they say amazing, there's nothing like anything I've ever experienced before. You guys have no idea unless you've experienced the, the love that he has for each and every one of you. Everyone here. He loves his children. Don't ever doubt that. Again, he, I was going to sing another song, but he said he wanted me to sing this one. And the nurse came in and said, you need to sing this one. So instead of four, it's only going to be two. But think about these things as, and listen to the words, please. I'm not a professional singer, but I love the Lord with all my heart. He's done so much for me. And I'll bet you you guys have stories like that. Heaven hears the song, your broken heart. 
this is his life for mine.
You'd be in the house of the Lord. Huh. Yeah, I'm going to want to prepare my notes and I know where we're going to be at this morning. It was good to be here yesterday for Jesse's memorial. I got a chance to know him just a little bit. Not much, but just a little bit. We played guitar up here one day. He was trying to get me back into it again. That was actually fun. I enjoyed it. I want to open up with a moment of prayer. And precious Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, dear Lord, for friends and family. Thank you for those who are coming in on the internet. We ask you, Lord, for you to bless the reading of your word. We ask for the blessing of your message. Your son's most holy precious name. The word says that it will not be turned away. We ask you, Lord, for you to be with us. I be behind the cross and let your truth reign forth. Your son's most holy precious name. We pray and give you praise on our Lord. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Our text this morning is going to come from 1 Corinthians 1 18. Those of you that know me and have heard me preach before, I will expound usually on one or two verses. Sometimes three, sometimes maybe four. But today we're going to focus on one verse. We're going to go to another couple, but our main purpose is going to be one verse. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 is where we're going to be at today for the bulk of the message. And said for the preaching of the cross of those that perish is foolishness. For the preaching of the cross of those who to them that perish is foolishness, but to unto us who are saved it is the power of God. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now, I like to take a verse and break it down word for word, and a lot of times I will sit here with my Bible and a dictionary. Because if I don't understand what a word is, even though I may think I understand what it is, sometimes a dictionary can bring to light a new meaning, a new perspective, a new angle on what you may be reading. I'm not saying that that's how you have to read it, this is how I choose to do it. We take a look at the first word here, which is for. Why is it here and what is its purpose? In Merriam-Webster's version of the dictionary, he says the word for means because of. So the first word is telling us, because of the preaching of the cross, it is to them who perish. Because. We take a look at another word, which is the word dove. The word is used to indicate a person or a thing that has already been mentioned or is seen or is clearly understood for the situation. The cross is the subject of this verse. For the preaching of the cross. We come to the next word, which is preaching. Now, I don't agree with Mary Webster's version or statement as to the word preaching. And I'm going to explain why. Because in some cases, they say that preaching is pompous. It's overinflated. It's bloated, arrogant, self-righteous. Nowhere in any of the texts that I've ever read in any case, if I ever see Jesus or any of his disciples being blown up, puffed out of chest, arrogant, self-centered, self-serving, self-righteous, if anything, 
They were compassionate. They were caring. They were urging, pleading on behalf of the kingdom, on behalf of the love of God. Come to him while you may. Come to him while you can. When Jesus talked to Nicodemus, he wasn't self-righteous. He didn't look down his nose. He spoke with authority. He spoke with purpose. <coughs> Nicodemus paid him a compliment. We know that you are from God because no one can do these things that is not from God. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. The word verily, verily, I used to think, meant, pay attention, don't miss this, but it actually means one who speaks from experience. One who speaks with authority. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, who was a man of authority, who was a man of position, who was a man of power, who was a man of influence, unless you are born again, you are not going to see the kingdom of God. You will miss it. This is not being arrogant. This is not being self-centered or self-serving. Preaching is proclaiming. Preaching is sharing, compassionately, urging someone to come. Okay? What are we proclaiming? Am I giving you a self-help message? Am I teaching you how to have your best life now? Is this why Stephen was stoned? Is this why Paul was beheaded? Is this why Andrew was said to have brought the gospel of Turkey and Greece? He was said to have been crucified. Thomas was speared by four different soldiers. Philip who also shared the gospel. And the only thing the scripture said about him was that he was cruelly put to death. Doesn't give details. Matthew said that he was stabbed to death. James was clubbed to death. Mathis was set on fire. Well, there's one for you. Let me live, help you live your best life now. We're going to set you on fire. Let me teach you how to have a better life. We're going to beat you to death. Simon the Zealot was put to death, and that's all the scripture said. It is not about a message of let me help you live your best life now. It is not a message of let me help you get along with other people. It is a message about let me help you put to death once and for all the flesh that is killing you. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that if Joel Osteen was to stand up here in this pulpit right here, right now, today, he would not be crucified, he would not be beaten, he would not be punished. He would get a clap on the back and a handful of money, maybe not from this church, maybe not from the people that go to this church, or maybe not from the people that hear this message, but he would get a clap on the back and a handful of money and say, good job. But in some churches, if Jesus Christ himself were to walk up here and to give a sermon, he would be accused of being not Christ-like. Period. You're not being Christ-like. Why? Because he spoke with authority. Because he gave a message that wasn't concerned about your best life now. Because he was not concerned about trying to help people improve their relationship with each other. He was concerned about trying to teach people how to improve their relationship with God. Let me help you to get forgiven. Let me help you to wipe the slate clean. I can guarantee you when we go back in and we take a look at John 3.16 okay? I'm sorry, John 9.16 the Pharisees were upset with Jesus and they were all livid with him. They said that this man is not of God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. This man can't be one of us because he doesn't do what we do. 
He doesn't keep our order. He doesn't keep our traditions. He doesn't do like we do. That's the problem. They were overburdening the people with things that were unnecessary. The Sadducees and the Pharisees both alike were overburdening people with unnecessary things. Getting back to our text. Jesus and any of the other disciples never acted in a self-righteous or self-centered manner. They were always acting in a compassionate, urging manner. Come while you can, for the kingdom of God is at hand. If you look at any of the sermons and where Jesus was teaching, the disciples were always giving people in an urging manner, compassionate, teaching, caring manner. Let me help you to understand. Let me show you where you went off the rails. Let me show you where you lost control. Here's where we need to get back to. We preach the cross. That's what preaching is about. It's about proclaiming the cross. We preach the cross and the horrible price that was paid on our behalf. In John 3.16, we see God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What did it cost God to create all this? Nothing. He spoke it into being. In the beginning, God said, God said, God said, he spoke it into being. Kids today in school are learning that we live in a cosmos. Let me let you in on something. We live in a universe. That's right. Uni, meaning one. Unicycle, one wheel. Unicorn, one horn. Uni, meaning one. Verse is a single spoken sentence. God spoke it into being. End of story. End of discussion. In the beginning. He started it. But let's take a look at the word love for a minute. Love is not a feeling. And I want you to understand this. Love is not a feeling. We've watched way too many movies, way too many TV shows, and listened to way too many love songs. Love is what you do in spite of how you feel. Right. Love is what you do in spite of wanting to do something else. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. Love is what Jesus has done across. Right. And at times, love doesn't feel good. At times, love is painful. Love hurts. And sometimes love can kill you. When Jesus was on the cross, I can guarantee you he wasn't, oh man, it feels so good. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Anybody hear that? That's what people were hearing while he was laying on the cross. Imagine this right here. After you've been beaten, to the point where your family can't even recognize you. Your own mother doesn't even know what you look like. Having this shoved in your back. Beaten and spit on to the point that nobody even knows who you are anymore. Then as you lay there, you're hearing this as they're driving through your flesh. Thank you, sir. Can I have another? Put one on the other side. Put one in my foot, please. This was not fun for anybody. And it certainly wasn't fun for the Son of God. Amen. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. It is a price that was paid on our behalf. 
God himself stepped down out of eternity, confined himself to space and time and physical form in the body of Jesus. Jesus himself said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, for the Father and I are one. I have come not to do away with the law, but to see that the law be fulfilled. God himself in the flesh of Jesus Christ is beckoning you. Come while you can. Come while there is time. And all the while, he is holding back his wrath, his anger, his fury. While he is beckoning you to come to him. And at some point, he's going to drop his hands. I'm done. I've had enough. I'm tired of asking. I'm tired of begging. I'm tired of pleading. I'm tired of urging. I'm tired. You have an opportunity. While you have breath in your body, to come to him while you can. This is what we proclaim. Not a self-help message. Not a self-improvement message. Not a relationship message. This is a message of your sin is killing you. Let me help you while I can. Because I guarantee you, when you draw your last breath, it is too late. It is over with. And whatever you are, when you draw your last breath, you're going to be that tenfold on the other side of the veil. So if you love God, if there's anything in you that loves God at all, it's going to be magnified, purified, distilled, and pressed down and overflowing. Amen. You are going to sing with the angels. You're going to sing with the heavenly choir. You're going to proclaim, prostrate in front of the cross at the feet of Jesus, for all eternity. Hallelujah. Holy is the Lamb. This is what you're going to be proclaiming. But let me tell you something. If you proclaim to be an atheist, if you claim to be a God hater, if you claim to be anything other than a servant of God, you're going to bust hell wide open. All the good in you is going to be gone. All the hate is going to be distilled, pressed down, overflowing. It is going to be such a putrid sight. And don't think it's going to be party hardy time because all the demons in hell are going to be after you. They can't get to God, but because you are created in the image and likeness of God, you are what they're going to go after. The Bible tells us that there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. There will be no rest day and night, period. There will be no rest for the wicked. There will be no rest for the weary. There will be no intermission. Time for step two. Back on your head. No, no rest for the weary. There will be no opportunity for any intermission. No opportunity for any intercession. It is over at that point. Your faith is sealed. You're done. There's an old saying, I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make him drink. And that's true. I can take a horse to water, and I, can, I mean, he can stand there all day and not drink. But I can salt his oats while he eats, and he will grow a thirst, and he will seek that water out. He will search it. Me telling you how to have your best life now doesn't get you forgiven. Me telling you how to improve your relationship with your spouse or your children or your boss at work doesn't get you forgiven. That's right. Me telling you that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life doesn't do anything for you. People are happy skipping into hell. Well, God loves me. All I have to do is live long enough and God's going to bless me. I don't have to say I'm sorry. I don't have to repent. I don't have to change anything. I just have to live long enough. And God's going to bless me. Unless the conscience is stirred. Unless the spirit that is in you, that makes you you, is moved at some point. And there is a call to action in you. And unless I make you angry, I'm not doing my job. Unless there's something that I say to you that causes or provokes you to move, I'm not doing my job. Each one of us sitting here has a conscience. Con means with, science means knowledge. So we have a conscience. We do what we do knowing that it's wrong. 
And when you sit there with a pie of soap on your face, I'm not as bad as this person. And I certainly ain't done what they did. And I know I ain't done this. Let me tell you something. You ain't that good. <laughs> You're not that good. Have you ever told a lie? I have not met a person yet who has not. <coughs> have you ever taken anything that didn't belong to you? Doesn't matter how big it is. Doesn't matter how small it is. Doesn't matter how expensive it is. Doesn't matter if somebody just laid it down and walked off and forgot it. If it ain't yours, don't touch. Leave it alone. And by the way, when you look at the Ten Commandments, go back and look at them again. <coughs> Something that was brought to my attention the other day, and I looked at it again this morning. Each one of those commandments carries a death sentence. Each one of those commandments calls for the death penalty. If you had a chain with ten links, <coughs> how many would you have to break in order to bust a chain? You may have to break one. That's it. Jesus said you can be innocent in the entire moral law. And there's over 600 of those. You can be innocent of every one of them. Break one offense. And you're guilty of everything. So if I don't honor God, put him in his proper place, and who of us can sit here and say that we have honored God in all facets of our life? I know I can. I can't say that I've honored God pretty much in any facet of my life, although I'm making an effort to. God said you should not make a graven image in heaven or earth or anything in the earth thereof or in the waters beneath the earth. He hates idols. And anything that is placed between you and him is an idol. Anything. We shouldn't take his name in vain. So if I claim to be part of his family and I don't attempt to share the gospel with you, then I'm taking his name in vain. I'm a faker. I'm a hypocrite. I'm a liar. I should honor my mother and father. I didn't honor my dad when I was younger and I regret it. I wish I could have talked to him now. It's too late. He's passed over. I try to honor my mom. I try to honor other people. We shouldn't lie. We shouldn't steal. We shouldn't commit adultery. We shouldn't murder. We shouldn't covet. Desiring things that don't belong to us. Desiring something that belongs to somebody else. I don't care if you drive a $130,000 car. My car gets me to work back and forth. And I don't have to worry about getting scratched on it. I don't care if you've got a 60 bedroom house with 10 bathrooms. I don't have to clean it. <laughs> my house is just fine for my wife and I and our daughter. And we're still working on it. But it's our home. And it's a home we've got to provide. The fact of the matter is, is that we're all going into a six by three by nine hole. And it don't matter how many toys you have when you go, we're still going in the hole. What I'm trying to tell you is this, is that to those people that are perishing, the preaching of the cross is foolishness. So if what I'm telling you makes no sense, if what I'm telling you sounds silly, guess what? You one of them ones I'm talking about. You are the ones that are perishing, and it doesn't make any sense to you. Wake up. Your clock is running. Amen. And we don't know when the stopwatch is going to stop. That's right. We're the only ones of God's creation that is breathing air, that has an idea we're going to die. We don't know when. I can ask our dog, when are you going to die? He don't know. All he knows is truth. <laughs> Come on. Come on. He knows when it's bedtime. He knows when the car pulls up. He knows when he, wants, when, when he goes out because we have him on schedule. But if I try to have a conversation with him, he ain't going to answer me. And he don't know. 
I ain't going to go get it to tell you when you're going to die. But we're the only one of God's creations that knows we're going to die, we just don't know when. I told a story about a young girl that was at a festival a few years ago. And there was a tower. They were doing bungee jump. Who wants to go try that? So she scurries over there. Her boyfriend is sitting here watching her. She goes all the way up there and just checks the things on her ankle. And she, whee! Her head gently just touches the ground. She goes, oh man, that's fun. I want to do that again. So this time he goes and gets it on camera. Gets his phone out. She comes over there. She puts the thing back on him. She jumps off. Something happened. And he had it on videotape, but her head went into the ground. She died instantly. She was in her 20s. There was a preacher that his son didn't believe. He was an atheist. He said, Dad, you can tell me all kinds of things in the Bible, but can you tell me where hell is? Son, I don't know where hell is, but I can tell you one thing. It exists. I know it exists. I don't believe you, Dad. He gets on his motorcycle and he heads out. He said, let me tell you something. For my son, hell was five miles down the road. He got hit by a car that ran a run, uh, stop sign. Hell for him was five miles down the road. And that's what it is. We don't know from one minute to the next. I could drop dead while I'm standing up here. I don't know. And neither do you. We have no idea. But one thing we do know is this. Is that we don't preach a self-help message. We don't preach a, hey, let me help you get along better in life message. Let me help you live your best life now message. That's why this message is foolishness to those people who don't get it. You can't wrap your brain around it. Why? Because why would a death 2,000 years ago mean anything to me? Why? This guy said nothing, did nothing, and as far as we can tell, thought nothing wrong. The Bible says that he led a, a life in thought and word of need of absolute perfection. So why would his death mean anything to me 2,000 years later? Well, let me let you in on something. So you have what's known as the blood of Adam running through your veins. Adam and Eve begotten and begotten and begotten and begotten. Eventually we're going to get down to Eve. Eventually. It may take a while, but we'll get to it. Jesus, however, while Mary was a willing vessel, the Holy Spirit ushered Jesus into this world. She was overcome with the Holy Spirit and the child was conceived. That is the difference. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. The Jews are great at covering sin. They're great at guilt. But they can't forgive sin. To slaughter an animal in a ceremony doesn't forgive sin. It sheds blood and it covers sin, yes, but it doesn't forgive sin. Jesus was a sacrifice once and for all for all mankind. Amen. All you have to do is place your faith and trust in him and your debt is paid. So what do I mean by placing my faith and trust? When you got up this morning, did your coffee maker make oatmeal or did you trust that it was going to make you coffee? I set it up to make coffee. It made coffee. I would have been shocked had it made anything but coffee. But I placed my faith in it that it would do what it was set to do. On my way to church this morning, I got out of the car, turned the key, the engine started. I had faith that it was going to work. Do I know the engineer or the mechanic to put that car together? No. But I have faith in their ability to do it correctly. I don't sit and jump off a train because it goes into the tunnel because I have no idea where it's going. I place my faith and trust in the conductor to get me where he's going because he does his job. Jesus does everything that he says he was going to do. If you want to know what he's going to do tomorrow, look at what he did yesterday. Does that mean he's going to do it the same way? No. Why? Because he can I want to go around the field instead of cutting through. I want to go this way instead of going that way. Why? Because he can. 
He does what he does because he can. Why did he choose the Jews? Of all the races on the planet, why did he choose the Jews? They had no money. They had no military. They had nothing. Because then people would say, wow, and he did all that with this? This here? This, this little nothing? He did all that with this? Yeah. He did all that with this. Imagine what he could do with everything. The message makes no sense to someone who is dying. Let me ask you a question. Does the death of Christ make sense to you? Seriously, does it make sense? That a debt that he didn't know he paid. If I'm in a courtroom and the judge is going to sentence me to life and somebody steps in and says, I'm going to pay Richard's fine. Or the judge is going to look at me and say, you know what, Mr. Robbins, and I've had this happen. I really am. They thought the bailiffs were in the back. They were laying bets on how long I was going to go to jail. I got picked up twice in one week for the same offense. Driving with no state plates and no insurance on my car. It was years ago. I was young and stupid. But the bailiffs are in the back laying bets on how long I was going to serve. They called my name. Mr. Robbins, how do you plead? Guilty with an explanation. I figured it's worth a shot. Well, talk to him. Talk to me, Mr. Robbins. What do you got? Well, Your Honor, it's like this. I'm simply trying to put food on my table. I got a gentleman that I work with, and all I was doing, even though I know I didn't have insurance and state plates on my car, we were going three miles to get a part for his car so that we could get to work. That's all I was doing, and I was going to park my car. I swear I was going to park my car. You know what, Mr. Robbins? I'm going to cut you a break. I got a year's probation. I got a $600 fine, and he told me, he said, don't ever let me see you in my court again. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So much thank you. And it could have been so much worse. He could have put me three to six months in jail. Easy. But because he showed leniency and compassion and concern, I was able to go about doing what I needed to do to provide for my family and learn a lesson. God has paid our fine. God has paid our debt. How do we repay him? Either we believe him, we take him at his word, or we walk away and attempt to pay the debt ourselves. That's a debt I don't want to pay. Because that debt is paid with an eternity in hell. And you say, well, that's pretty, that's pretty stiff penalty to pay. You know, I mean, couldn't, you know, couldn't I do like purgatory or couldn't I just like be annihilated and don't exist anymore? Why I gotta go to hell? Well, let me put it to you this way. If I lie to my kid, I lie to my dog, my dog don't know nothing. He knows when it's time to go out, he knows when it's to eat, he knows when it's time to go to bed. But I can tell him why, he don't know nothing. I tell a lie to my, my kids, oh, they might get upset, but I'm dead. I tell a lie to my wife, she's gonna get upset. I'll probably sleep on the couch, but we'll get over and we'll move on. I can lie to the police and I'm gonna get a ticket. And if I lie enough to the police, I'm going to get hauled into court. Now, I'm not a judge, and I'm going to go to jail. The way things are these days, if I lie enough, I'll probably get into politics, and I'll wind up being president, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but traditionally, if you lie to the president, you can go to jail, and you can end up being executed, depending upon how bad the lie is. We're talking about here committing a most grievous offense against the ultimate creator of the universe. God himself. 
And when you commit such an offense to God himself, it carries with it the strongest punishment. It carries with it the most heinous of punishments, which is an eternity in hell. And by the way, if you go there, it's your choice. That's right. God doesn't send anybody to hell. You send yourself. I don't believe in God. Well, you know what? Your decisions have consequences. That's right. We've told our granddaughter for years consequences. You can do whatever you like. I choose not to follow God. Okay, fine. I'm 40 years old. I choose not to follow God. Okay, I'm 60 years old. I choose to follow God. Now I'm in my 80s. My time's running out. My clock is ticking. Eventually, I'm going to be on my deathbed. You still want to follow God? No. It has consequences. Because it has immediate consequences, short-term consequences, and long-term consequences. My wife believes in God. I choose not to. Well, now we're unequally here. Now we have a situation. I choose not to follow God, and I'm rubbing on my kids. And they're following me because children are by example. So now you have a generation that's coming up behind you and they're choosing not to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. Their kids don't follow God. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't ever quit. This is not a self-help message. This is not a just live long enough and God's going to bless me message. I know Ray Comfort, and I've talked to him on occasion. I met him in Atlanta years ago. And one of the things that he brought to my attention, if we could roll the clock back to September 10th, 2001, you have the same knowledge then that you do now. You've been asked to give a message in Tower 1 of the World Trade Center. Message is the gospel. What are you going to tell these people? You've got five minutes. What are you going to tell them? Let me give you a hint. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Is not going to keep anybody out of hell. But if we stir the conscience, if we awaken what makes them them, if we poke the spirit and they feel stirred and maybe, just maybe we can awake a sleeping conscience and we can stir them to action and we can provoke them to make a decision for Christ. We have a fancy van? If they are, they're hiding. I don't see them. Okay? We don't have the lights and the smoke and we don't have the, the videos and everything else. What you win them with is what you're going to keep them with. By sharing the love of God, by sharing compassionately, 
urgently preaching, proclaiming the word of God. You can win souls. I gave a sermon the other day, Psalm 19.7. Was I not mistaken? It said, the teaching or the teaching of the cross, no. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The law of the Lord, the instruction, follow his direction, follow his urging, follow what he's giving you, and you will become wise. Beyond your ears. This is not a self-help message. This is not, we got to follow this person. We're not going to elevate one person equal to Christ. The Bible tells us that there is no other name under heaven by which man may be saved. So praying to the saints is not going to get you there. Calling on baby Jesus is not going to get you there. Jesus is a grown man. Not a baby anymore. He's a grown man. He's also not brother of the devil. Because I've met, there were two young boys that came to our house the other night. Two Mormon missionaries came to our house the other night. I have a sign in the front of our house that says, pull over, let's pray about it. They said, oh, we see you're a religious man. Um, your, your name was given to us from your neighbor down the street. We, we see you're a religious man. Could we talk to you about Jesus Christ? Uh, no, you cannot. I can talk to you about Jesus. And by the way, thank you for coming here. Why don't you have a seat? So I proceeded to tell these boys who were elders from the Mormon church that they're following a false doctrine and that they're playing the fire and that they're leading people astray. And if they don't get back on the right path, they're going to wind up in a deeper pit in hell than most people will because they're following a cult. To have the gumption to stand up to these boys and tell them that. And I told them, I'm old enough to be your grandfather. Each one of them, 19 years old. And it's not, I, I'm not saying this to brag about it. The fact that each one of us has the, the authority to speak on behalf of us. We are emissaries of a king. Amen. We are here to deliver a message. Amen. Not help each other try to live better or have a, a, a wonderful life. We are here to be ambassadors. That's right. The preaching of the cross is to those who perish. We are in a dying world. There are people who are dying every day. Every day, 150,000 people die or taken to death and never seen or heard from again. When was the last time you shared the gospel? When was the last time you helped somebody develop that relationship? When was the last time you questioned them about it? When was the last time you checked yourself? Because it said, to those who perish, it's foolishness. So if what I have said here for about the last hour makes no sense, we need to come. We need to sit down right here in this front pew. If you want to go back in the office, I'm sure we can find an empty room somewhere. We can sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And by the way, if you're not here and you want to get in contact with me, I'm sure that you can find the number or you can find my email address. We can have a conversation. Pastor Tony can help you find it. Brother James can help you find it. Brother Terry can help you find it. Okay? These men, all three of them, Stevie back here can even help you find it. All these men in here, these ladies in here can help you find it. These ladies in here probably know more about the Bible than some people do. These men know what they're talking about when they talk about Christ. So there is no excuse. The only reason is, I don't want to. I'm an atheist. No, there is no such thing as an atheist. And I'm going to tell you this. There is no such thing as an atheist. Either you're a doubter, is what you are. Either you're an honest doubter, or you're a lying doubter. What's the difference between an honest doubter and a lying doubter? An honest doubter just don't know but is willing to find out, is willing to do the research, willing to question, answer me, help me to understand. That's an honest doubt. A lying doubt, don't care. 
A lying diver is just like a criminal who can't find a cop. They ain't looking. <laughs> I mean, it's, seriously, an, a, a, a lying downer is one just like a thief. They're not looking for a police officer. That's why they can't find them. You can't find God if you are looking around. You don't understand because all of creation screams his name. All of creation screams God. This building did not show up on its own. This microphone didn't evolve out of nothing. If I wanted to find out who built this microphone, I could look on it and probably find a name somewhere and contact somebody and maybe by a serial number, excuse me, a serial number somewhere in there, I could find out who actually put this one together. And I could go ask them about this microphone. Not that one, this one. Same thing with creation. If you want to know God, you have to seek him out. The Bible says that if you want to know Jesus, if you want to know God, you have to know Jesus. If you want to know Jesus, you have to read the Bible. You have to understand it. You have to get in it. You have to have a relationship there. That's right. My wife and I, I, I heard something the other day and I brought it to her attention. The guy said, you read your Bible one day a week, there's really no change. If you read your Bible two days a week, there's really no change. Three days a week, there's a little bit of change, but not much. But if you read your Bible four days a week, just four days a week, and we're not talking an hour, just four days a week, a couple minutes, read a few verses, try to break them apart, understand what they say, you will find out that your mood is going to change, your relationships are going to improve, your life is going to improve. Just four days a week. Try it out. See how it works. Okay? The preaching of the cross to those that perish is foolishness. But to us who are saved, it is the power of God. Those of us who have felt the calling, those of us who have felt the urging of the Spirit, those of us who have submitted to the authority of God, who have relinquished the reins of our life to Him, we have crucified the flesh and brought it into submission subdued it and brought it into his will. It's the power. It's the power of God. It is that which controls our life. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship. Amen. It is an ever-growing relationship. I've been married to my wife 22 years. And I get told, you don't listen. I get told that a lot. I figure it's a strange way to start a conversation, but you know, it is what it is. But I love her. And I try to learn things that please her. And I try to do things for her. If we're in a relationship with God, why would I not want to spend time in His Word? Why would I not want to read His Word? My grandmother we lost her a while back. And I asked her. She told me she was saved. And I said, you want your Bible? That, that's my grandfather's Bible, by the way. And I had the sister to it, which is my grandmother's. No, I don't want to read it. Well, I think, okay, she's in her 80s. Her eyes are a little failing. You know, I understand. Things happen when you get older. Well, how about I get you an audio Bible? You know, the nurses can come in and they can change it out for you. You listen to a CD. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to listen to it. Don't you find that a little strange that you... How would you feel if your spouse wrote you 66 love letters... Or you wrote 66 love letters to your spouse and they didn't read really one of them. How would you feel? I would feel kind of upset if I wrote a letter to my wife, even though she has a hard time reading my hand. Okay? If she couldn't decipher what I wrote or even made an effort to. I found 66 letters that had never even been opened. I'd be kind of heartbroken. 
And I guarantee you, she'd be upset with me if I didn't at least make an attempt to read anything that she wrote to me. God has written 66 love letters right here. 66 of these. You want to know God? you got to know Jesus. You want to know Jesus? you got to get in this. That's preaching. That's proclaiming. Not a fluffy, let me help you get your best life now message. Not a self-help seminar. If you're going to preach, preach. If you're going to preach the gospel, preach the gospel. Not a self-help message. Not a best life now message. That's preaching on the cross. And it will help convert soul. It will help bring children into the kingdom of God. Amen. And you will have brothers and sisters like you've never seen. Amen. But that's what we preach. And it makes sense why people don't get it. It makes sense why people just, that's just so stupid. It's because you don't get it. You don't understand it. Because you are looking at it with a closed mind. Closed off. Because your conscience is either seared, your heart is turned to rock, and you're shut down. But it's not a case that he who dies with the most holy wind, you're not taking it with you. That's right. That sin that you're enjoying here, you can't take with you when you go. It'll go fall through your hands like sand. Go to the beach and grab a handful of sand. See how much of it comes up. You can't take it with you. You can't enjoy it there. You came into this world naked. You're going to go that way. Somebody gave you a bath when you were born. You're going to get another one when you die. Somebody was crying tears when you were born. Somebody's going to cry tears when you leave. We're not taking nothing out of here. I, Donald Trump is going to go into a grave at some point. Bill Gates is going to go into a grave at some point. It may be a expensive for you, but it's still going to be a whole lot of grain when you boil down to it. So preach the gospel. Even if it doesn't make sense. Preach the gospel. That's what we're here to do. As children of God, as ambassadors of the kingdom, that's what we're here to do. Is to preach the gospel. And make sure we preach the correct gospel. God loved us. Loved us enough to die for us. Whether it was one sin or a thousand, he loved us enough to die for us. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for giving us the message of the gospel, the good news, the things that we need to proclaim, the words we need to speak. And we ask you, Lord, that you be with us and take care of us and provide for us as only you can. Cover us in your grace and your mercy. It's in your son's precious holy